so nice to have everyone here today for our program uh, for Louis Riel Day. And uh, my name is Grant Wedge. I'm here as the Executive Director of Policy, Equity and Public Affairs at the Law Society. And I'll be the moderator for this afternoon's panel. Um, and then, of course, afterwards we have an event upstairs and uh, you'll get a chance to uh, assess the various strengths of moderators because we have a different gentleman doing that session. He's warned me. Um, I'd first like to start off by recognizing that this is a traditional territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit. We're very pleased to be here. At this point, it is my honor to introduce the treasurer of the Law Society of Upper Canada. Treasurer is the chair of our board, uh, Janet Miner. Senators, members of the Métis and First Nations communities, fellow Law Society members, honored guests, and friends. I'm very pleased to bring greetings to you and to welcome you to our 12th annual Louis Riel Day for public education and equali our equality event. Today's program could only be possible because of the good relationship that we, the Law Society, enjoy with its community partner, the Métis Nation of Ontario. During today's panel discussion, we will hear from Métis lawyer Jean Taillé, Jason Madden, as well as lawyer Andrew Loken. They will share with us their views about the latest leading court decisions that will impact the Métis community. 2014 has proven to be a productive year in the legal developments around not only Métis, but also broader Aboriginal rights. These decisions further define the concept and parameters of Aboriginal title, and in the case of the Daniels decision, Aboriginal identity. With these decisions as the backdrop, I turn to the role of the Law Society in the broader justice system. Our primary mandate is to regulate lawyers and paralegals in Ontario in the public interest. At first glance, this may sound like a narrow scope for our role, but it is the public interest mandate that not only gives rise to our commitment to promoting equity and diversity in the legal profession, but also informs our access to justice mandate we have a statutory responsibility to facilitate access to justice for the people of Ontario. Over the last two years, through the Action Group on Access to Justice initiative, the Law Society has focused its resources and energy to better understand what it means to facilitate access to justice for the people. Through TAG, as we call it, we have learned that access to justice means different things to different people and different groups who make up Ontario. We are now embarking on a renewal of our Aboriginal strategy, and concerns about access to justice in that strategy figure prominently. The first phase was launched with the public release of the Aboriginal Bar Consultation Report in 2009, and I believe that was one of the first ever done by any law society in Canada. That report contained four proposals for action, all of which are well underway to being implemented. In moving forward with phase two, we are committed to doing so in a good and well-informed way. We hosted a roundtable last June with Aboriginal lawyers and paralegals. They encouraged us to look outside the profession to engage with Aboriginal leadership and community to better understand their needs. Our renewal process will focus on consciously learning to understand the issues which are important to Aboriginal communities and why they are important. I'm talking about appreciating the spirit of the time. There are many factors that feed into this state that we need to learn about, including history, both the known stories and the emerging stories from the Aboriginal community's perspectives, the current grassroots movements, including Sisters in Spirit, Orange Shirt Day, in which I participated in Thunder Bay, and Idle No More, and the impact of the Supreme Court decisions we will hear more about today. They will influence the actions of the community, the private sector, and governments far into the future. We are only beginning this renewal process, so we have much to learn.
However, one theme that has emerged to define the spirit of this time is that of reconciliation. The work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission over the last five years has initiated a profound change in how Canadians understand the impact of Indian residential schools on all Canadians. It's difficult to express in words because I find myself turning to phrases like our relationship with Canada's Aboriginal peoples. As I learn more about reconciliation and what it truly means for our collective future, I realize that the first step in reconciliation is not to focus on us and them, not to focus on the distance between. The Indian residential schools affected all Canadians, not in the same way, obviously, but their legacy has impacted all of us, and reconciliation means that we start by accepting that fact. So to tie this back to the Law Society and our work in renewing our Aboriginal initiative strategy, our path forward will be guided by gaining understanding of the Law Society's role in reconciliation, and we look to you for that. To help us, we rely on the generosity of the Métis Nation of Ontario in being our community partner for today's event. We also benefit from the generosity of today's panel speakers who will share their experience and insights. Finally, we learn from you, the audience, as you participate in this dialogue today. You are sharing your time with us. For that, I say thank you, merci, Megwitch, and merci. Thank you very much, Treasurer Miner. The Law Society is very pleased to host this event today with the Métis Nation of Ontario, and I recognize President Lipinski and members of executive who are here uh, and staff in support of, of this event. Today is part of the Law Society's Public Legal Education Equality Series, and this series runs throughout the years to encourage the exchange of information, ideas, and action on legal issues, particularly those related to rights and interests of Aboriginal people and equity-seeking groups of all kinds. Um, I was remarking to Jason as we walked in that I can remember coming to this hall before it was uh, train, tra transformed as it is, and uh, a young Jason Madden was presenting at uh, one of the Métis events that we held back um, probably in the last millennium, Jason, not 50 years ago. But uh, it has been part of a continuing component of our outreach uh, to focus on Métis issues, and we're very pleased to be able to do that again this year. We're very fortunate to have the breadth of speakers. As the Treasurer has indicated, uh, we have a number of very distinguished uh, counsel who are with us. Uh, the ground rules for today is that we've asked them to speak for approximately 25 minutes or so, and uh, then we will have a chance for questions. We've got some microphones in the audience, and I'm sure we can have an active dialogue. Uh, we're going to try to wrap up by around 6 o'clock so that we can uh, retire and uh, have uh, some hospitality and some time together. I see people coming. Come on in. Uh, we've got lots of seats uh, still up at the front. Um, so... Just to introduce the speakers, and um, I'm going to start with Jean Taille, and it's one of those things when you know people, it's always a challenge to, to start and, and realize, well, you've got a handout uh, if you picked it up at the table. Uh, Jean is an extremely accomplished counsel and Métis activist. Uh, she graduated from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law in 1994. She's a member of the bar, not just here in Ontario, but also British Columbia, Manitoba, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. And she's a partner with the law firm of Pape Salter Taille. She specializes in Aboriginal rights, and uh, specifically Métis rights. And I see a volume on the, uh, on the desk that I'm sure she's going to refer us to. She has been part of all of the leading Métis cases in this country. And uh, I just want to say, Jean, that uh, in my time of working with you, it has been such an honor, and uh, you have represented your people so very well. Uh, she was recognized uh, at a ceremony at the Indigenous Bar Association uh, and received the Distinguished IPC designation, and I was very proud to be there that night to hear her honored by her colleagues from across the Aboriginal Bar, the Indigenous Bar, First Nations, Métis, 
and Inuit. Uh, that was some years ago. Beside Jean is Jason Madden, uh, and uh, Jason is a descendant of and uh, Senator, um, what I have down here is the half-breeds of Rainy River. And of course, in that document of 1873, Treaty 3, that was the term that was used. Uh, and uh, it is one of those anachronisms of the past. He's a partner also at the law firm of Pape Salter Taye, and he specializes in Aboriginal rights law with an emphasis on litigation, consultation, and accommodation-related matters and the negotiation and implementation of modern day treaties. And I suppose I can say this, I do see some of my colleagues from my days with the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, and I will say both Jean and Jason are tough negotiators, but they're principled negotiators, they're fair negotiators, and I want to recognize that in this province, I think we have been able to make substantial progress. We haven't fixed everything, but under the leadership of the MNO and with the, the counsel that you have provided, we really have made a difference. Uh, and Jason is also called to the bar, not just here in Ontario, but also the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and he's appeared at all levels of court. Um, and if you get a chance, when you go on those Supreme Court tapes, it's always fascinating when you see either Jason or Jean get up, they command the attention of the court. In 2014, August, uh, Jason was recognized as one of the Canada's 25 most influential lawyers by Canada Lawyer Magazine. So, those are our two Métis lawyers who will speak first. And then Andrew Loken. Andrew pra practices in the areas of constitutional law, appeals, administrative law, labor and employment law, and pension litigation. He got his legal degree from the University of Ottawa and then an LLM, a Master's of Law, from Harvard University. And he clerked with now Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin of the Supreme Court of Canada. He was called to the bar in Ontario in 1991. Prior to joining the firm of Pallier, Roland, Rosenberg, Rothstein, Andrew worked at, the Nash, at a national law firm and taught law at the University of Ottawa and Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He has appeared in more than 20 cases before the Supreme Court of Canada and regularly appears before other tribunals um, and other bodies. So we're going to start today with an opportunity for Jean uh, to give us uh, her views on what has been happening uh, over the last year. And again, as I say, we're going to have time for questions, so be thinking of those as you hear the panelists. Jean. Thank you, Grant. Um, folks, there are places up at the front. Please, please uh, make yourselves comfortable. You don't have to stand throughout. There are some places. Um, do I have a clicker or anything? It's your life without a clicker. Really, <laughs> really, and even for me, who's very geographically challenged, I think I can figure out what the green arrow means. Um, so, uh, essentially, I'm going to wade in on uh, fairly murky waters because it, this, is, this case is all about identity politics. That's what it's all about. Um, or you, you can call it law, identity law, if you want to. But um, since I take a very instrumentalist view of the law, and I tend to think that the law is just politics writ down by particular people, um, it is, it, this is, this is what is going on here, is a decision about how you identify Aboriginal peoples in this country and who has jurisdiction for them. So in many ways, the, the question before the court in Daniels is the classic Canadian constitutional law question. It's absolutely classic. We've done it with light beer and colored margarine and dairy and eggs and everything, which is, is it a provincial or a federal responsibility? That's really what's going on here, is who gets responsibility for a bunch of people that nobody wants? That's what this all comes down to. Nobody wants them. We have been in, it's been described, uh, Clem Chartier calls it jurisdictional limbo. That's because he was raised as a Catholic. Um, 
If you're not a Catholic, you might not even know what limbo is, but it's the no man's land you live in if you're not good enough to go to heaven and you're not bad enough to go to hell. So um, other people call it jurisdictional football. I don't tend to think of it as football because football is about people wanting the ball. This is about people getting rid of the ball, right? You know, this is really about people saying, no, 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 here, you hold it. No, 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 I don't want it. Here, you're throwing it around. So, but, but that's the issue. Neither the federal government nor the provinces want the Métis or what we call non-status Indians. So that's this whole case. So I have to say that um, I commend CAP for taking the case on because it needed to be taken on. Um, uh, Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, whom Andrew represents, so he'll probably tell you more about it. But it is an issue that many of us have felt for a long time needed to go to court. We need a resolution, a legal resolution of this problem. So I do commend CAP for bringing it. Um, now, the big question before the court was, are Métis and non-status Indians Indians within the meaning of 9124. So for those of you who don't know, 9124, the Constitution is broken down into what I call sort of think of as Constitution Street. And um, the house on the right side of the street is 91. That's where the feds live. And there are lots of houses, rooms in that house that um, have different things in them. So room number 9120, at 91 Constitution Street Room number 24 is where Indians and lands reserved for the Indians is. On the other side of the street is a house called number 92, and that's where the provinces are, and they have their own issues. So the issue here is our Métis and non-status Indians, Indians. Okay, so the first thing to make very clear here is that for Métis, this is not a question of being culturally Indians, okay? No Métis are seeking to suddenly become First Nations. In other words, they're not trying to suddenly become Mohawks or Cree or um, Haida or Tlingits or the Dene, right? The issue is that Indians is just the language that they used in 1867 when they drafted the Constitution. If we were drafting it today, my suggestion is, and I think that Gwen Jones, the expert at trial, said this, and I think the judge agreed, we would have used the word Aboriginal if we were doing it today. We would have said, so the question would be, are Métis and non-status Indians Aboriginal within the meaning of 9124? But back in 1867, they used the word Indians. Now, we should be glad that you know, Columbus coined the term Indians because there's always a joke in the First Nations and Métis uh, community that, you know, it's because Columbus thought he was landing in India, right, that we're called Indians. Well, if he landed in Turkey, you know, we might have a less, less, not to say that Indians is a pleasing name, but maybe there's some that could be worse, let's put it that way. Um, so the question, again, is not one of cultural identity, right? Because Indians, as a term, has no cultural meaning. It is strictly and only a legal term, right? You are an Indian, but that's not your cultural identification. So if you were a First Nations person who is a Mohawk, you could be a Mohawk and you might be an Indian, registered under the Indian Act as an Indian within the meaning of 9124, or you could be a Mohawk who is not an Indian under 9124. So the question here is, are Métis and non-status Indians? And I'm going to get into the difference between Métis and non-status Indians. But before we start with this, um, we need to look at who they are, right? So I start with one big premise. And I, I understand that for some of you, this is muddy, uncertain. And some of you, this is old stuff. You've been there, done that for a long time. OK, I'm starting with a simple premise. Métis and non-status Indians are not the same. They are not the same peoples. They're not the same individuals. They are not the same. Now, despite the fact that the case, if you read it, refers repeatedly to MNSI and lumps them all together as one group, they are not the same people. Métis are, um, and the judge found this, and the Court of Appeal upheld it, a people, an Aboriginal people, but non-status Indians are not. So 
well, I'll get into it a little bit more. But so how are they diff different? That's the big difference. The Métis are a people within sociological and within our legal concepts because in law in Canada, our Supreme Court of Canada has held very clearly that Métis are a people, an Aboriginal people, and um, the court in Daniels affirms that. So that's the big difference. Non-status Indians are not a people. So now I have given many talks about who the Métis are, mm, quite a few of them here in this room in its various formations. Uh, so I don't propose to go over that ground again. If you see that book there, Métis Law in Canada, there's a whole chapter in there on Métis, who they are, where they are, all about them, uh, all the reasons why Canadian society has a hard time understanding that they are part of us. And that book's for sale. You can talk to me at the end of the show. But um, so having said that, I'm not going to go into it in any great detail today because uh, otherwise... We'll be here for an hour and a half. Uh, so, quite simply, just to put it in a nutshell, Métis are a distinct Aboriginal people. They have their own language. It's called Métis. Um, they have their own culture. They have their own kinship connections. They have their own geography, homeland, which we call generally the Métis Nation. Now, to date, there are no other Métis peoples in Canada that have been found. There are many cases in the East Coast in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and repeatedly, I think we're up to 14 or 15 cases. Again, they're all listed in the summaries in the book, um, where the courts repeatedly say, no, there's no evidence of a historic Métis community. Now, there's a few places that are a bit of outliers still. One of them is there's a Corneau case in Quebec where they're still going through. We don't know what the result of that will be, so I'm just kind of sitting waiting to see what that says. Um, but the only other place in Canada where we talked about another Aboriginal people was in Newfoundland, and it, specifically in Labrador, and there was a group there that used to call themselves the Métis Nation of Labrador or the Labrador Métis Nation. Can't remember which way around that went. Um, but they, even they, have recently decided that they are not Métis. They are, in fact, an Inuit culture, and they've changed their name to Nunatukavut. And now they still like to claim that they can scoot in under Métis law, I think they're going to be disappointed because the very first idea of being a Métis is self-identification as Métis. And if your first premise is that you self-identify as Inuit, I think you have a problem that isn't going to get you to step two. So put it simply, the Métis nation is to date the only Métis people that has been found, and it has been found repeatedly to exist by certainly the Supreme Court of Canada um, and uh, by in Cunningham, in the Manitoba Métis Federation case, in Powley, all of these th cases affirm the Métis uh, as a people. And Daniels did it as well. The trial judge did and so did the Court of Appeal. So what that's what the Métis are, a distinct people. What they are not is a bunch of individuals who have or a recently formed collection of individuals. I'm told that after Pauli, over a thousand Métis organizations sprang into existence. Um, this is mostly people who go out and do their genealogy, find out that they have an ever so great Indian grandmama, and then sometimes like in 1704, and say, whoa, I'm Métis, I have constitutional rights. These are the groups that are getting smacked down in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, the courts are saying, no, 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 you don't, this, it's not a genealogical game here. Um, this isn't the way it works. So Métis are not that, they're not a recent um, discovery of people who did their genealogy, or, and it's not people who lost their connection to a First Nation or somehow lost their Indian Act status. So that's as much as I'm going to go into. So now, why is it so confusing to everybody? Why are Métis confusing? Why are non-status Indians confusing? Because I think we, the second premise I should have started with is this is really confusing. Uh, and if you're confused about it, you're right. It's confusing. You should be confused. This is anything but clear. Part of the problem with it starts with the historic confusion, right? So it becomes when the Europeans arrive, and they meet up with the Aboriginal people, and a lot of people, there's a joke that goes out of there, when was the first Métis born? Oh, nine months after the Europeans arrived. Ha ha. No, it's not true. 
right? That's the first time somebody with mixed ancestry was there, but the first generation does not make Métis. There's no culture there, there's no language, there's no people. That's just people who have from one group, ethnic group and another ethnic group, produced a child who now has parents from two different ethnic groups. It doesn't make a people, it doesn't make a, a unique kind of individual. This kind of idea is going on all over the world, right? Um, so, the, what happened though is as the Europeans come in, as we said, they called all of these peoples they met Indians, right? So, um, now the other thing to say is that after they start to arrive, the explorers start to marry, we say à la façon du pays, right? But that really means after the custom of the country is what that means. What that really means is there probably weren't any priests around. Okay, so was out, without benefit of church is really what that really what that's all about. And that says a lot more about us and our ideas about marriage than it does about Aboriginal peoples and their ideas about marriage, right? So um, now the first families are a central feature of the settling of the country, but we also I want to re point out that we're in Ontario right now and we tend to get very Eurocentric on this stuff, right, you know? But you should really understand that on the West Coast, you've got a whole other thing going on. There are Russians coming over um, and Asians coming over. So the Tlingits, who are situated right on the sort of BC, Alaska, Yukon border, they have a whole bunch of them have Filipino ancestry. So when you go into the Tlingit community, you can, get, you can typically get fed Filipino food on the reserve. And that's because of the mixed ancestry and it's all about the fish canneries and how no white people would work in the fish canneries so they brought people over from the Philippines, men over and who else was working in the canneries? The women who were First Nations so you have relationships and you have children who have mixed ancestry. So the other problem besides geography which creates this confusion of peoples is language, right? So Métis have lots of different names. I've put some of them up here. Um, you can see everybody had a different name for the Métis, but if you start at the, the sort of French and English ones, which would be the ones we are most familiar with, you can see that there's a lot of different language going on here. And all of this was synonymously used for Métis and for non-status Indians. So you're starting, I hope, to see the hopeless, confusing mess that we're in just because of how people are named, right? And there's no clarity on this at all. So what happens is my theory is this. The first generation doesn't make anybody Métis or non-status Indians. Second generation doesn't do it. Third generation doesn't do it. Probably even the fourth doesn't do it. It's not until we begin to get into the 1700s, and I mean the latter half, like after 1750, that the Métis start to coalesce into a people. It takes a long time to grow a new culture, right? A new language is not born overnight. A new culture is not born overnight. It takes people to move away from their parent cultures and create something new, which is what the Métis did. Non-status Indians in the 1700s are, do not exist yet. They haven't even arrived on our historical horizon yet, right? So Métis begin to coalesce by the eight, 1790s, 1820s. There's a little bit of debate about among, in the academics about when it is. Personally, I don't think it matters. They, you know, by 1820, you've got a full-fledged new people on this continent here, right? So still, 1820s, you still don't have non-status Indians. Now, there's, there's the the location of the Métis Nation up there. As you can see, it's broad and large. Um, basically comes from Ontario to the Rocky Mountains, goes down into the states and up a little bit into the Northwest Territories. Now that's large, it's true, but if I were to draw you a map of the Cree, it would be just about as large. And if I were to draw you an Inuit map, it would be just as large as well. So on different parts of the country, but it's not unusual because they're very mobile people. Remember, these are the fur trade they were running in the fur trade and they were the buffalo hunters. So they're moving around. Okay, so by the 1860s, the Métis are famous all over the world. Harper's Magazine ran in the 1870s, a series of sketches about them and the buffalo hunt. There were marches um, in uh, Paris after Riel was hanged. 
Um, there were marches in Quebec after, Par uh, after Riel was hanged. Uh, it was on the front pages of the New York Times and things like that. It, the, this was big international news, what happened um, with Riel. But it's only then, towards the 1800s, that we start to see the creation of non-status Indians. And who are non-status Indians? What they really are is people who are not on a list. That's really it. It's the only common denominator. The Indian Act has a registry. They have an Indian registry. It's a list kept in Ottawa. The definition in the Indian Act of who can go on that list has changed many times over the years. Um, usually it gets narrower, knocking people off the list, but occasionally it expands as it did in 1985. Um, so it changes. But the issue of a non-status Indian is just somebody who's been knocked, their ancestors or they have been knocked off that list, right? And that's all that is going on there. And they can be of any culture of the First Nations, right? Is people who are knocked off the list. So. It's a very odd identifier, if you think about it. I mean, how many lists are you on? I figure we're all on a whole bunch of lists, right? So if you were knocked off the voting list, would you be an, a non-status voter? If you're knocked off the credit card list, would you be a non-master charge, non-status master charge? Would you, I mean, it, it's a strange idea to identify yourself by virtue of something you are not, right? It's a, it's a very odd uh, concept. So, um, and I, when I say the not status Indians are only now being created, I'm talking about the 1800s still. Um, but they're not a people, that's the whole point, right? They're from all different kinds of people. They're everywhere across and they're created for, they're really a bureaucratic creation. Or actually they're the bureau, in it, I don't mean this against the people themselves, but they're basically a bureaucratic wastebasket, right? They're all the people who got thrown off the list and thrown into the garbage can as we don't want you anymore, you're here. Right? It has devastating effects and very real effects on their lives and on their children and grandchildren, but that's, they are really a bureaucratic creation. So um, now Daniels, just to get back to the case, Daniels does not say that no non-status Indians are within, within 9124. That's not the way I read the judgment. What the judgment is really saying as I read it is that the court was not prepared to make a big sweeping statement that all non-status Indians are within 9124. I, it appeared to me that they're making a suggestion that the cases would need to be brought in a different way. Now that's really unfortunate and distressing for um, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples who have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money trying to resolve this issue only to have a huge part of it perhaps not answered and be told go back and reformulate it another way. But it looks to me as if there would is going to have to be some kind of idea of case by case or issue by issue. So in other words, bring a case about people who lost their status because they joined the army. Um, or a case about people who lost their status because, they, like a, almost like a class action kind of thing. And then you could deal with one issue about why people lost their status and whether those non-status Indians are within federal jurisdiction. Otherwise, the court doesn't appear, the court appears to think this is too broad, too vague, and they're, they were deeply troubled uh, by that. So how does this affect the MNO and the Métis in Ontario? I think the short answer seems to be yes and no. Sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> but, but the yes, because the ruling that Métis are within federal jurisdiction, I think is a really important clarification of the law. We needed it. At the very least, we needed to know whose door to knock on. Right after Pauli, we, they were still telling us, oh, you're not, don't come to us in Ontario and don't go to the feds, right? Um, and even after the Manitoba Métis Federation case, which I, and I'm sure Jason's going to talk some more about that, we still were left with the feds saying, yeah, but pff, nobody said, the court didn't say we have to deal with you. They just said we made a mistake a long time ago. So, and there's still, and we also know they've denied Métis programs and services, so for example, health benefits and things like that, for a long time and said right flat out front to us that, well, no, 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 we can't do that because that would be an admission that we have jurisdiction for you. And they didn't want to do that, right? So it will be very helpful to everybody all the way down the line to know which door we have to knock on when we want to talk to somebody about Métis issues. Um, 
So, and it'll be helpful because we won't be that jurisdictional football game anymore. They won't be able to play that game with us anymore. That would be really helpful. Um, and I think it will be make it more difficult for the government to exclude from, for example, land claims processes. This is going to be very important in Ontario with respect to Treaty 3, the Robinson-Huron claims, all of which have promises to Métis embedded in the process that never were, we would say, in good faith or um, appropriately uh, followed through on. So there are broken promises here in this province for Métis in the treaty process that need resolution. And we need, but right now, we're excluded from the treaty process and from the specific claims process. So, um, but I think it has very little effect on MNO's identification issues. And that's because MNO already has a really solid registry and really clear criteria about who can register as Métis according to the Métis Nation, and that is because the rules are very clear that you have to tie to Métis ancestry, not just um, Indian ancestry. So uh, Daniels will have some effect on the registry, though, because going back to my point that Métis and non-status Indians are not the same, and we it's helpful, because we've been saying this for years, but it doesn't stop all the people, and I see the registrar for MNOs here, it doesn't stop thousands and thousands of people a year who are non-status Indians from applying, right? It will be very helpful to have law behind us to say, no, <laughs> you, you can't do that. Um, and, and it will also be helpful for them to know that they're not being arbitrarily excluded, right? It's not just because we don't like you, right? It is because the law is saying it for you. So I think that will be helpful to them, and it will be helpful to them to know that if they have claims, they need to go back to their First Nations. Because all, the whole idea of being a non-status Indian is somebody who identifies as an Indian, right? Not as Métis, so they should be knocking elsewhere. Now, I'm almost done, but I'm just gonna, this, was, I, this is what I wrote here on this day last year. I said, Daniels will resolve, likely by 2016, the issue of jurisdiction for Métis. Are Métis federal or provincial? My prediction is that the courts will confirm that Métis are federal jurisdiction. Um, so I thought that was interesting um, that I actually wrote that last year. Now, so where are we right now with this? So we just heard this morning that Daniels, the leave application, from the Supreme Court of Canada is going to come down on November 20th, so that's next Thursday. Now, I'm gonna come out again on a prediction limb um, and say that they're gonna grant leave. Um, so I think they, I think they will. Um, so you know, not that I've, you know, I'm, I'm wrong sometimes on this, but I'm, uh, I'll go right out on a limb and say they're gonna take this. Um, so since it's November timetable, my suspicion would be that by this time next year, we'll be arguing it before the Supreme Court of Canada, and we will have a judgment in 2016 from the Supreme Court of Canada that will clarify this. So in case you didn't know, um, the Congress of Aboriginal People, so the, the Court of Appeal in Daniels found that Métis were within 9124, but non-status Indians, they declined to make a declaration on that one. Um, and so, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples appealed the ruling with respect to non-status Indians, and if the court grants leave, the Crown, the federal Crown, has asked to cross-appeal on the issue of the Métis. So, both issues, if the court grants leave, are gonna be squarely before the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, now, my prediction with respect to the non-status Indians is that the Supreme Court of Canada is gonna uphold what the Court of Appeal did and say that they're not gonna go there either. So, anyway, I am uh, going to be uh, very interested to hear what Andrew has to say because while well, Jason and I were interveners for the Métis Nation of Ontario and the Manitoba Métis Federation on this, uh, Andrew was actually legal counsel for the Congress of Aboriginal People. And I might add that he's an excellent lawyer and he did a wonderful job. So, um, and, and I'm honored to be here today with both of these fine lawyers. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Jason and then you can hear from Andrew. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'm actually going to talk about uh, something completely different because I think Jean has ably uh, captured the uh, 
identity issues. I'm going to talk about how Daniel's fe feeds into something broader that, um, that I guess law nerds like myself are grappling with and that I think that the Supreme Court of Canada is going to have to try to address in Daniel's because I think, you know, to certain, to somewhat of extent, they've left it, there's still ambiguity and there is um, a lack of clarity on some of these issues. And I think the question really becomes what's left in 9124. Um, and this comes from other cases that have recently come down from the Supreme Court of Canada, Shilkoten and Kiwaiten. And I'm gonna talk about those. Um, I'm also just going to say that, uh, um, you know, our issues around identity, the Métis Nation was, is very happy with the Federal Court of Appeal uh, decision. And I think that you can see, you know, at, at trial, the Métis Nation was not, not at trial. Um, but we had a pretty good force at the Court of Appeal, the Federal Court of Appeal. And I think that the decision more aptly reflects the Métis perspective, and so I encourage everyone to read the uh, Federal Court of Appeal decision in Daniels. Um, it's not quite as complicated uh, as the trial judgment, which I still have difficulty getting through, um, but I think it provides some of the answers. I'm going to talk about what are all these things about, and I always refer to this as the Métis chessboard, um, because the reality that underlies all of this with Daniels is that you have a people who no one wants, a people who uh, do not yet, in many cases, have a treaty relationship with Canada, and that needs to change. Whether people want to, because um, the one thing that I will say is, you know, Gene and I, and this is, you know, one of the, is we aren't going anywhere. And in fact, um, the Métis, whether, and the case law just continues to reaffirm what everyone used to think that we were crazy in saying, of that of going, and that has to change. The idea that First Nations are somehow more special, or Inuit claims have more, you know, uh, robust than ours is just fundamentally wrong, and the law is not playing that game. And so, get on with it at some point in time. Now, I refer to it as, and we keep on moving. I, I say we keep on throwing rocks at the window and at some point in time it will crack. But that relationship, while well, progress has been made, is not at a stage where um, a treaty relationship is entered into. That's my thesis, that's where we're going, and, and I quite frankly think that's the trajectory. And whether people like it or not, um, it's gonna happen. Uh, and I think that I, you know, I just point to, you know, Jean's Métis Law in Canada. I remember when, you know, I first went to law school and Jean had her little thing. It was called Métis Law, Métis law Summary at that point in time. It was five pages long, right? Because that's all the case law we had. Now we have a robust, growing case law on Métis issues. And to be quite frank, and, and also I will say this, there's always the thing of, well, yeah, that's Métis Law, though. This is First Nations Law. This is, this is where the real action is happening. This is, this is where 90% of everything happens. But you know, I just have, I, I do take some justice in, you know, the big seminal case from First Nations law that everyone heard about was the Shilkoten case. And in order to figure out who the rights holder is in the Shilkoten case, where do they reach for? Powley. Because it's the first time in Powley, that's when you're actually having to begin to deal with the, the, the previous cases in the First Nations world was all about, well, we'll just go right to the bands because at least there's a structure there and we assume that they're the rights holder. In Powley, that structure didn't exist and the court had to create a framework. And in Shilkoten, which was about who actually is the title holder, they reached for that framework. So the, I don't know if it's a bleed or the integration or the reality that Métis law is a key piece of Aboriginal law on par and equal, and in some cases, driving the issue. And I actually think Daniels is going to be extremely important because I think many First Nations and many of us who have um, always made some assumptions about 9124, um, in recent cases of going, huh, what's left in there if it's, um, if it's really all just devolved down? So I'm gonna talk about that, and I'm gonna start with the concept. 
of 9124, or what the historic context is. And so I'm gonna actually start with MMF because I think it begins with a great story. And it's about this, co this country named Canada that was young at one point in time. And in 1867, some colonies got together and then they, you know, that saying, look west, young man, they looked west. And they saw that there was a large land mass there that was completely in not in their control, even though, um, uh, and, and filled with different Aboriginal indigenous uh, uh, peoples. And that Sir John A's plan was that they, to go westward, and this meant, deal, de this meant dealing with the indigenous peoples who were living in the Western territories and on the prairies, these consisted mainly of two groups, First Nations and Métis. And I'd just like to say that I've, I'm, I'm increasingly encouraged by the Supreme Court of Canada how they're in, you, the, the language is changing, right? They're not talking as much about Indians or natives or, and they're using terms like indigenous and, and, and the vernacular's changing. And that's positive, I think, for all of us because it, it's inclusive. Um, you know, one of my lines in, I think, MMF was saying, look at all of this case law says Aboriginal and there's no asterisk that says except the Métis. Right? The, the Aboriginal is defined in our Constitution. It has to be the assumption that it applies. So, um, and, and I, I love these. I'm going to highlight some of the Supreme Court of Canada's wonderful understatements that I just, I just love. Is, um, they go, so this was the government policy, you know, like it or leave it, um, but it's just the reality. First Nations was to enter into treaties with various bands whereby they agreed to settlement of their lands in exchange for reservations or of land and other promises. I think that's a little bit too simplistic, but I, I, that, that's how the Supreme Court of Canada uh, starts it. And then they say the government policy with, with respect to the Métis population was less clear. Well, talk about the understatement of the century, right? It's really, what, what happens with the Métis is that there's no policy. It's just whenever they run into these people and they're uppity and usually upset about their lands being taken or they're pushing back, the, they say, okay, what do we do to get us through the day? There's a policy, and, and you see it. It's, it's like this crazy patchwork of policies. In the Red River, it's, of course, the Manitoba Act, Section 31, becomes the, uh, the anecdote to, uh, or, uh, to dealing with the Métis, and the Treaty 3, it's the half-breed adhesion. And Robinson, you know, in 1850 says, well, I'll get you later, right? I'll do the treaty with the First Nations, but I'll come back for you later. And this, and this continually progresses across Western Canada. There's no cohesive policy. And the assumption was, well, they don't really have rights. They're not quite Indians. So clearly, they, we don't need to treat with them, and we don't need to establish these same relationships. And we say that's wrong. And I think that the courts are increasingly saying that's wrong. So here's the young Canada in 1867, and the red part is those colonies, and then there is one of Jean's maps that I've stolen, the Old Northwest, or the geography of the Métis Nation, and it's the fur trade routes of Ontario and the Western Territories, because I, uh, people always crumple their face when they're like, are you telling me Northern Ontario's Western Canada? And it's like, well, no, it's a concept. And as Gene says, from the blue area, that's the center of the universe, which, you know, people in Toronto still thinks, think is, uh, and, and, and same with Montreal. And, and the Northwest that keeps on talking about is it's a perspective, right? Everything North and West are from where we are, right? The center of the universe in Toronto. That's the Northwest. It's not a specific line. It's a concept about where settlement has not yet occurred. And so, of course, there is the map of what comes out with those historic First Nation treaties, um, where in the areas that people really wanted, and uh, and uh, or and you can see there's some areas where those historic treaties from Treaty One uh, all the way to Treaty Eleven in 1921 um, uh, deal with. And then we have a break from 1921 where the assumption is, oh, well, we did these treaties not because we were obligated to it, do it. We did it out of goodwill, and it's, it's, it's just a political obligation. And we stopped the political obligation. We don't want to do it anymore. And, of course, in 1975, we have the Calder case and the re recognition that Aboriginal title is not... Um, 
uh, was not extinguished and that there is a requirement to continue that negotiation process. So that's the one of the interesting Canada's new modern day treaties. So you see where the historic treaties are and um, then you see where they're negotiating or where the modern day treaties are. And then, but the assumption and I just, this map, Maps drive me bonkers um, because they essentially erase other peoples. And so the assumption is you kind of look in that Ontario uh, to Northern British Columbia thing, they go, oh, well, we, we, uh, we at least got all that taken care of, right? There's, there's treaties in place there. But that, there's another Aboriginal people there, and they're called the Métis. And it's unfinished business there, and that's what the MMF case is about, and that's what Pauli is about, and that's what Daniels is about, um, or at least that's what I say they're about. And, um, and it's all about that that narrative or that treaty relationship or whatever you call it, right? You can call it modern day treaties, you can call it modern day land claims agreements, you can call them agreements, but there needs to be a relationship with this other Aboriginal people, and that is not in place yet. So I'm going to talk now about the constitutional framework, and this is a really law nerd thing, but it's something that's been driving me bonkers lately about what the Supreme Court, how the Supreme Court of Canada has been, I wouldn't necessarily say sloppy, but they have not necessarily provided clarity on these issues, and I'm hoping actually um, even though Daniels is really about our Métis in 9124, the first starting point that you're going to have to start about is, what is 9124? What, what is it really about in our, in our Constitution? And is it really just a relic of the past? Because, you know, and, and to a certain extent, you could be reading the cases now and saying, huh, 9124, section 35 is where it's at, people. Don't pay attention to what came before because we don't need to. Now, I'm not necessarily one that subscribes to that, but I've got to say that um, there, is, there is some key questions. And I will say this, back in the 1970s, when Section 35 wasn't around, and the lawyers who practiced in our firm, some of them were practicing at that time, and I've got to tell you, this is the background story. So things for 90, when 9124, or things like fiduciary duty, that's what they reached for because there were no other legal tools to protect Aboriginal interests and rights, right? So they used the division of power to insulate the provinces from attacking the rights of the Indians. And they also, you know, grabbed fiduciary duty, which is a very clear legal concept, and they pulled it and twisted it and kind of made it fit as a tool in order, to, um, in order to provide some justice and protection for Indians and Aboriginal peoples at the time that were before the courts. And what you kind of see now is, since Section 35 is, you, you see a, a reluctance to go back to those old tools and you see a court that is far more comfortable of going, we like this tool. It's flexible, it's, um, it allows us to do what we need to do, and that tool is essentially Section 35, these concepts of the honor of the crown that, they, that the court has been developing over the last 20 years. And the question is, is that are those old tools still necessary? I think they are, um, because I think that there's some I don't know, uh, solid logic or um, consti the, the constitutional framework just shouldn't be thrown out um, you know, with a new one. And you can't explain the old case law unless you kind of fit these things together. But um, so the old constitutional framework, and this is how I understand it, and I could be fundamentally wrong, but I understand it this way, is that the federal crown inherited the imperial crown's commitments and obligations towards Aboriginal peoples as set out in the Royal Proclamation and other documents. And this is, okay, when that colony gets set up, the imperial crown has these obligations, and, and we all know from the Royal Proclamation of saying, go out and essentially negotiate treaties or essentially um, extinguish the Indian title, which drives me bonkers, but that's the concept from the day. And that has to go, in this is my thinking, to the national government. The treaty-making power and the obligation owing to the Aboriginal people is in the national government. It, some of the, it doesn't make sense that it transfers down to the provinces. Um, and then also that that treaty-making power lies in the royal prerogative. It doesn't lie in the division of powers. And people may, and you'll see, 
The court doesn't necessarily agree with our understandings of that, but that was the assumption, is that it's in this royal prerogative, and 9124 is the corollary of that. It allows the legis legislation to be passed by the, na by the federal government, but it's not necessarily where the treaty-making power lies. There's a positive obligation that rests with the national government, and I just don't think that then it, the treaty-making power devolves through the division of powers. But I could be wrong on that, and, and, and who knows? Um, section 9124 is the necessarily corollary of the treaty-making power and responsibility. And so that's the historic kind of concept that that sits there with the national government, and that's why they, they create the comprehensive claims process. That's why they're dealing with those issues, because they're still obligated to, to fulfill that national project that is ongoing, which we call reconciliation today, but is part of that reconciliation is essentially treaty making. And then the current constitutional framework, as those of us who deal with modern day treaties or are thinking of this is, you know, you're negotiating a treaty with the crown, there are commitments made there, then parliament passes legislation to implement the negotiated treaties. It's not through 9124, that's how they operationalize it and give it the force of law. And other potentially implicated federal powers, the authority to negotiate and enter into treaties prior to legislation being passed is grounded in the royal prerogative and the obligations. And while it's recognized that provincial governments are necessary, absolutely necessary parties to the modern day treaties, they similarly pass legislation to implement the negotiated treaties because of their jurisdictions in relation to land and other provincial powers. But the federal government, and this is my thesis, and I'm sticking to it, continues to be, be obliged to take the lead in advancing treaty making with Aboriginal peoples as the national government and, and pursuant to the royal prerogative. Now, that's, I think, you know, Professor Hogg kind of agrees with that. Some of the case law agrees with that. Ross River Dene Council, Justice LaBelle kind of articulated that, but it's never been, the, it's never, the court's never been completely confronted with it. But I think that what we what we do see in um, in Daniels and Kiwaiten is that that may not necessarily be true. So this and and I can tell you for the Métis Nation of Ontario, we intervened in Kiwaiten and um, and uh, made this point to them. And and I can tell you, the Chief Justice was not interested in hearing the point. And this is this is from the Ontario Court of Appeal. They say the con they they say the exact opposite of what I just said. So I'm I'm okay. I've been in the, a minority for many of my years, so I'm, I'm comfortable with, uh, with being outside the norm. But this is what the Ontario Court of Appeal says. It's common ground that, the, that Canada negotiated Treaty 3 pursuant to the power conferred by 9124. I'm not sure if it's, it's, it's the power confirmed by 9124, but Justice Phelan from Daniels also agrees. It says, it is 9124 which gives authority to the federal crown rather than the provincial crown to exercise the treaty power. So. I think that one of the questions will be, hopefully in Daniels, is that what is 9124? Because if you're going to do a purposive analysis of whether then Métis fit into it, the starting point is, is that why do we have this here? And why is, and, and it just, and that it's with the federal government, doesn't that matter? Doesn't that still mean something? And what we've seen recently in Kiwait and Shilkoten from a far more I don't know, pragmatic or practical approach is that the Supreme Court of Canada is giving signals that they may not necessarily agree with that. Um, and I think that people could necessarily read Shilkoten and kind of go, huh, could the provincial government enter into a treaty with Aboriginal people without the federal government even being there? And I pr previously would say absolutely not because the royal, because one, we don't let, you know, Quebec go sit in international conferences and say, hey, we're representing um, our interests. It's, it's through the national government that treaties or um, that, that happens. And I think the same thing has to be true with um, treaties with Aboriginal peoples. Now, that's my um, assumption, but, but whether it's true or not, I'm, I'm not sure anymore. Um, so why does this matter? Well, Section 35, as I said, is, was a watershed, um, and I, th I, I think that it has really changed the discourse. It's a powerful tool, but you can't, because there's something new, you can't then divorce yourself from what 
the case law in the past has said, because these things are really important about who has to negotiate treaties, where does the obligation lie, and it really is important for, some, for the Métis who don't have that table yet. And now I, I will say I'm not I'm not one of those purists that kind of go oh you need you know you need the answers to all these questions. Um, my my point is for the Métis Nation of Ontario and for the Métis is well we kind of just at least know where in the chessboard we should be going next in order to get to the place that we want to be, which is uh, you know engaging in treaty making. So. Um, of course, Delgamook says it's through negotiated settlements in good faith on all sides that will achieve the stated purpose of Section 35. Powley says, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, this isn't the way how you deal with things. They should be negotiated. In Vanderpeet, it says Section 35 presides the basis for just and lasting settlements of Aboriginal claims. And, of course, uh, Haida Nation says, where treaties remain to be concluded, the honor of the crown requires negotiations to adjust settlement of claims. And then, most recently, the Supreme Court reaffirms it and says, it, uh, Section 35 protects Aboriginal rights against provincial and federal legislative power, and it provides a framework to facilitate negotiations be, uh, and reconciliation of Aboriginal interests and those of the broader public. Now, the point being for the Métis is, okay, well, what door do we go knock on in order to begin those treaty negotiations? Is it you just solely focus on Ontario? Or is it that the federal government still has a role? And I think this is, you know, the, the, um, the assumption in this map is that the federal government still has a role. In all of these tables, the federal government is sitting there and the provinces join on, sometimes reluctantly, sometimes they're actually, you know, in the BC treaty process, it's really the province that's, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say driving it, but they have significant interest because they're the ones that own the lands. And I guess the question for me really becomes, how, what, mapping that out is going to be important in Daniels for the Métis for, for uh, I think, a few reasons. One. All of these things, I, I call it like the trifecta for Métis, because this is, in, in the Royal Commission report, there were a series of, there were three, I think, key issues that um, the Royal Commission 20 years ago said yes, yes, yes to, and the federal government said no, no, no to. And the first was, okay, well, do Métis have Section 35 rights? Because, of course, and I'm not going to go to, to that, but, um, you know, go into Powley in detail, but what Powley was all about was, okay, well, Métis weren't here as contact. You set out the test as contact in Vanderpeet. Does that mean Section 35 is a me fool you? And of course, the Supreme Court of Canada says absolutely not. Um, uh, and, and Powley recognizes that Métis have Section 35 rights, uh, and those existing Aboriginal rights have not been extinguished by treaties, and in many cases haven't been dealt with by treaties. The second prong was that there's, um, and, and this was the federal government's position in 1981, of, and why the MMF filed the MMF land claim, um, or the MMF case as it's referred to, is the, the Department of Justice and the then minister Jean Chrétien wrote a letter to the Métis National Council and all of its affiliates and said, we have looked at all of your claims, we believe all of your claims have been extinguished or superseded by law. And so Section 31 in the Manitoba Act, which provided for the 1.4 million acres of land, of saying, huh, too bad, so sad, they're expired, moot, et cetera. And of course, the MMF case for, goes through litigation for 30 years. The decision comes down in March 2013, and they go, nah, those outstanding claims still sit there too. And then the last of the trifecta, or the last leg, is I think clarity on jurisdiction, is whose door to go knock on. And, um, and this is essentially the Daniels case. And when you put those three things together, and I, and I, and Gene, Gene and I have this constant debate of then, is, is it, can I, can we try to get the court to say something in Daniels, or is it that we're gonna have to take another case, right? But you put those three things together, and we essentially say, no one's talking to us, right? We're excluded from the specific claims process. We're excluded from the comprehensive claims process. The provinces say, not our, you know, not our circus, not our monkeys. And then essentially, where do you go? There's got to be some place. And where do those just settlements of Métis claims come from? And I, and I personally think that, you know, I... Uh, that it's either Métis have to either have a unique process created for them, 
or they need to be allowed to be in the comprehensive claims process because that is the only way um, that you're going to actually see some of these issues that, um, uh, advanced. And interestingly enough, the federal government is right now undertaking a consultation. They've appointed a special representative, Mr. Doug Eifert, um, who is undertaking consultations about does that old comprehensive claims policy need to be updated. Now, I don't necessarily think, now I was recently at a series of meetings with the Métis light leaders, he, they were really looking at updating it for the BC First Nation, the treaty process in BC, and, and all of a sudden he just realized, he goes, oh, wow, I didn't understand this is there, um, i.e. that Métis need a place as well. So um, these are just quotes from, and, and I, I just wanna say that all of the cases are saying this, right? So Pauli saying there's a need for a combination of negotiation and judicial settlement will more clearly define the Métis right to hunt and i.e. negotiations. In Daniels, and I wanna say this, Daniels I don't believe is about programs and services because I don't think you're gonna win on programs and services because you have 15 two. The government can design one program for one group and design another program for another group and not apply it equally and can say, well, this was an ameliorative program. Where I do think though is the idea that Métis have outstanding claims, outstanding rights, and there's no place for them to go and negotiate these that is the injustice. And I think the Federal Court of Appeal highlights this, of saying, look at, yes, it's, it, you know, part of the, the Congress of Aboriginal claim, uh, People's claim was about um, uh, programs and services, but the other important part of it is this claim puts in issue, among other things, the failure of the federal government to negotiate or enter into treaties with respect to the unextinguished Aboriginal rights or agreements with respect to Aboriginal matters or interests analogous to those treaties and agreements with the federal government has negotiated with, this is a bad sentence, um, has negotiated and or entered into with status Indians. And what they're really saying is why the Métis want this declaration is because you aren't doing that with them. And it's not just about programs and services and, the, and there needs to be something there for the Métis. And then, of course, this is from the MMF case um, where they say, you know, Section 31, the ongoing rift in the national fabric that Section 31 was adopted to cure remains unremedied. The unfinished business of reconciliation with the Métis, of the Métis people with Canadian sovereignty is of a matter of national and constitutional import. And I gotta tell you, my head almost exploded when we recently received a letter from the federal government that they, they have read the MMF case and they say, but it doesn't tell us we have to do anything. Well, you know, neither did Calder in 1973, um, but the reality is, is of course you have to do something. The, the, a rift in the national fabric, how are you going to resolve it? The only way you resolve it is through negotiations and just settlement. So, and I'll just point to another thing in the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur Report. They say, Government of Canada does not appear to have a co coherent process in place to address land and compensation cl claims of Métis. Canada should take active measures to develop a procedure in addressing Métis land claims. So, what does this all mean? And, or what is my basic thesis of it? It means that when you put those three things together, this area that people have, oops, for many times assumed of going, well, we've got treaties there, it's done. Um, and of course, I don't necessarily think those treaties mean that it's done either. Those treaties are about a relationship and sharing and an ongoing uh, uh, respectful um, uh, process. But it's coming to a theater near you. And I think that that's what the case law and that's what Daniels and um, uh, is going towards. Métis are on that trajectory. So I don't know how much, how, I'm done? I am done. Um, in the presentation which is circulated, I have some more points about uh, how Shilkotan and Kiwait and essentially, um, I, I, I just wanna say there's, there's in a, recently in Shilkotan and Kiwait and you know, the, the court says, well, just in case you thought there was something special in 9124, there isn't. Um, you know, section 35 and interjurisdictional immunity is all gone. I, I've read the cases. I had real trouble with that. I gotta tell you, I'm like kind of going, I can't read this case and reconcile that. And all I can say is recently over the past two weeks, I've been able to hear Justice Binney and Justice Yakabuchi um, speak. And, and, I and I asked them both the same question because I gotta say, okay, am I just reading the cases wrong? Was I, was I daft that what 
the Chief Justice did in the recent cases is really a fundamental shift. And so Justice Binney said, yes, he was shocked. Um, and and uh, those who know him would kind of say, well, he's, he's more dramatic. And then um, Justice Yacobucci said, I was mildly surprised. And, um, and it's very interesting about, um, I, and I think that in Daniels, those issues about what's left in 9124 will be front and center. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I have to say that uh, when I saw the Chilcotton and the Kuwaitan case, uh, I had a little bit the same reaction as, uh, as Jason did. And particularly from my point of view, uh, I have been litigating the Daniels case since uh, 2001. So I'm, I'm well into the second decade. And, and uh, you know, it's a big undertaking to do a trial. It was a nine-week trial and everything. But I had this feel, feeling that we'd, we'd worked so hard for so long to get Métis into the Section 9124 room, only to discover that it's empty. I mean, <laughs> what's that all about? Uh, anyway, I'm going to talk uh, a little more about the record uh, and the trial process uh, uh, because I think I have a somewhat different perspective uh, on the matter than, uh, than Jason and, and Jean. Uh, I do want to say that I wish that the Métis Nation of Ontario uh, and other MNC affiliates uh, had been present at the trial. I understand that they were unable to get funding for it, didn't have the resources for it. It's a very major uh, undertaking. CAP, uh, by one means or another, was able to get funding, including an advanced uh, costs uh, order. But it was a nine-week trial. Uh, it looked at uh, all across Canada. It's, it spanned history from, from uh, Champlain to Charlottetown Accord. Uh, we had five different experts. Four of them were historians. Uh, and, and perhaps very importantly, there was a treasure trove of internal government documents uh, which we were able to get through the discovery process and then address through uh, a couple of witnesses, former employees of the federal government, including a, a gentleman by the name of Ian Cowie, who was a very impressive witness. He'd been an, a former assistant deputy minister in the federal government, and he'd been a deputy minister for the Saskatchewan government. So he knew the whole government policy side, which is very important. Uh, I believe that the record that we assembled uh, on the Daniels case at trial was the most comprehensive look to date at the history and circumstances of mixed ancestry Aboriginals across Canada, uh, what Senator Gordon referred to as the middle ground. Uh, and obviously it included the Métis, it included the claims of many who say that they are Métis and over whom there may be controversy. It included those who were referred to as non-status Indians. It was a, a, a very broad uh, spectrum. But the thing that was striking to me from these government uh, documents particularly was that the internal documents really showed three key facts. Uh, first, that the federal government had, had and has had and continues to have a pretty good idea of who these people are. There's a series of precise estimates of populations across Canada, and we're not just talking about the Métis of uh, the West, of the Métis nation, we're talking across Canada. Uh, there's demographic information, and there's really a wealth of information there that they'd been sort of secretly studying and nobody really knew, or had gotten lost in files and forgotten about. Uh, some of it was somewhat dated, and uh, uh, that, that is perhaps to some extent uh, reflected in what comes out in the decision, but curiously, the federal government did not call any witnesses to explain any of that or give their own perspective on that. They were content to let those documents uh, go in. Uh, the second key fact is that the federal government itself recognizes that these people and these populations uh, are people and communities in need. Uh, and there was a, a frank and candid recognition that these are among the most disadvantages, uh, uh, disadvantaged of all Canadians. And, and thirdly, uh, there was a frank recognition that all of these mixed ancestry Aboriginals in their communities across Canada had suffered from, and you can use whatever term you like here, political football, uh, political buck passing, or what the uh, trial judge politely referred to as the jurisdictional avoidance feature. And what you got is, uh, and the government knew this, and they were aware of it. Uh, what you got um, was a sense, particularly as you looked at the broad sweep of history, that there was a hundred-year-old federal-provincial 
funding dispute, which is, uh, again, what could be more Canadian than that? But unfortunately, this is one that had real consequences for real people. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about terminology. Let, let me first say, and about definition, at trial, uh, it was the plaintiff's conscious choice not to get into definition. We did not think that definition uh, or, or trying to establish identity or make it a case about identity was the fruitful way forward. We thought that that was something that was uh, very dangerous and could be exploited by the, by the Department of Justice lawyers. Uh, and uh, I'll return to that uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, and so we made our focus on the history of government policy, the nature of the government power. Because, you know, government powers are broad. And if you look back at what governments have actually done, not just in Western Canada, not just Ontario, not just Central Canada, Eastern Canada, the North, over a long period, you'll actually see that in practice, the federal government has assumed sporadically a very wide jurisdiction. And then you say, well, if that was true then, why isn't it true now? And I have never perceived there to be a divergence of interest between, for example, the constituents of the uh, Métis National Council and its affiliates and the constituents of CAP and its affiliates, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples and its affiliates, because I think that all come within this theory uh, uh, of the case. Now, uh, there were some moments during the trial that, uh, that um, you know, brought some of the identity stuff to the, to, to, to the fore. Uh, one thing that happened fairly early on is that the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs changed its name to the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. And that was great. And the judge said, oh, I, I read in the paper today that there's been a name change. That's really what this case is all about, isn't it? He just made that as an offhand comment. Where they're nodding and the Department of Justice lawyers are there saying, no, no, that's nothing to do with it. <laughs> but it's, you know, and I, I think that Gene is absolutely right. Had the right terminology been used in 1867, there would have been no dispute. This is really a case of the federal government exploiting the wording of a provision that was never really apposite and reflects, uh, you know, a, a different uh, time and a different uh, mindset. Another thing, perhaps a little bit uh, humorous, you know, obviously you go back to the old documents, uh, they very rarely, 19th century documents very rarely have the word Métis in them. Some of the French ones might, but the English ones, very rare. They always talk about half-breeds. We're dealing with, uh, and they talk very inconsistently about half-breeds as well. You might have uh, letters written by John A. Macdonald talking about half-breeds on a reserve or off a reserve or whatever in Ontario or, or Upper Canada in the pre-Confederation period. But then you might, you, you'll see the same term terminology referring to what's clearly Métis communities across the Northwest. Uh, and you're not sure to what extent the framers of Confederation really distinguished between those concepts in their own minds, which again, to me, just says, go broad church. Uh, you know, everything should be within this expansive uh, government power. But, but I do remember one particular moment. The, the, the Crown witness was up, a man called uh, uh, Alexander von Gurnett, and he's going through documents, and we're so far into this trial that we've we'd become a little bit desensitized to the impact of, of talking about half-breed because that's what we're reading from a historical document. But it's, it was in the Supreme Court of Canada building uh, that the trial was held, uh, and it was in May and June, and so the school year is still in. So every once in a while, a, a class full of school kids would, would come in and watch for about three minutes and be stupefyingly bored and then go out, right? Uh, but at one point, he's there testifying, and he's talking about half-breed this and half-breed that, reading from the documents, and a class comes in, and all of a sudden, he sits up very straight, and he changes his language, you know, and he starts talking about Métis, and I, well, I don't see that in the document. Oh, now I get it. So obviously there's, there's, a, there's a sensitivity uh, there that, uh, I mean, it, it, it's clanging to modern ears. But to get the historical context, you have to go back and see uh, the, the, the type of words that were being used. And, and you know, that continues on. Uh, in 1939, the, the court looked at re-Eskimos. We don't say Eskimos anymore. That was a pejorative term used by some First Nations about the Inuit. Uh, but, you know, the re-Eskimos is talking about the Eskimos because uh, that was the terminology of the day. In the historical development, our case was, and my perspective remains, that the labels are really not the key to the issue, uh, and, and neither is people's actual identity. We did not, and I don't mean to say anything about anybody's identity, how they self-identify. Obviously, in 1939, the Supreme Court of Canada had no trouble concluding that while the Inuit are different sociologically, have different 
self-identification. They are different peoples than First Nations. They still came within the term Indian in 9124. And I think that that uh, is equally true of the Métis, and it's equally true of uh, people who are referred to as non-status Indian. They are all within the word that should have been uh, Aboriginal. So what happened at trial? We got a, a declaration that Métis and non-status Indians uh, are all within section 9124. And indeed, at trial, most of the controversy, or a lot of the controversy, was over the Métis, because the federal government was saying, well, wait a minute, you, you've always said you're distinct, so how can you be Indians? You, you, you're the people who chose not to be Indians, so you're not within the federal power, and history, history backed us up on that. Uh, Non-status Indians, they almost conceded and you know didn't fight quite so hard about and professor hogg had said non-status indians are clearly within federal power and metis it's more difficult there's some documents from the 1980s in the federal government uh, uh, conferences around the repatriation of the constitution where the same points had been made at one point uh, minister crosby uh, John Crosby had said, well, you know, non-status Indians we accept are within federal jurisdiction, but Métis are a distinct people, so they're not because they've defined themselves as something different. Uh, and, and so a lot of the battleground, the more difficult issue, was over, over the Métis. So we were very happy that we got the result that we did that uh, was an inclusive uh, uh, result uh, at trial. So we get to the Federal Court of Appeal, uh, and there um, uh, I, I share with uh, Jason and Jean uh, the delight that, the, um, that, that with respect to the Métis, the declaration is upheld, because that was being very strongly challenged by the federal government. And they were smart enough at the Federal Court of Appeal level to not really go after the factual stuff, because there's not much chance of getting factual findings overturned. Their main argument was one about well, just because we have jurisdiction doesn't mean we have to do anything. That's what uh, Jason just referred to a, a few minutes ago. Jurisdiction is not equal to responsibility. And so it's useless. Why give this declaration at all? It's not going to solve anything. It's not going to give anyone a program or a service. It's not going to put food on anyone's plates, et cetera, et cetera. We said, and the trial judge had accepted, and the Federal Court of Appeal accepted with respect to the Métis, that practically speaking, it's still a very important question. The question of whose door should we knock on is still one that, uh, that has enormous consequences for people. It, it doesn't guarantee you a result to know that the federal government has responsibility, but it does guarantee you an audience, and every once in a while, a government does the right thing. So, for example, uh, I hear laughter. <laughs> So, for example, one compelling historical fact is that after the uh, Rieskimos reference, uh, which was a tussle between the Quebec government and the federal government, there, were, there was starvation up, up in northern Quebec. And so there was a real need to provide starvation relief. Uh, and the, and there, there was the after U. Alphonse uh, issue where Quebec said, well, they're not our problem. And Canada said, well, no, not our problem. It goes to the Supreme Court on a reference, and the Supreme Court decides federal. The federal government then introduced uh, you know, first uh, some social welfare, and then over time has developed programs and services, which are not the same as First Nations, but are roughly comparable in scope. So then, in that case, having been their jurisdiction being pointed out to them by the courts, they have proceeded to do the right thing. And it's my fervent hope that however Daniels ends up at the end of the day, whatever groups or population or definitions or whatever are included by virtue of that case within 9124, uh, that again, the government will do um, the right thing. I may not hold my breath, but I, I am an optimist. Um, I, I do say, though, that the Federal Court of Appeals reasons for excluding non-status Indians uh, were not, to me, compelling. Uh, they, they were not because the, um, the, the, the court believed that the federal government did not have jurisdiction. Uh, rather, the Federal Court of Appeal thought that with respect to non-status Indians, uh, it, it would not have practical utility. A, a lot of this was driven. It's driven partly by their sense of who non-status Indians are, and I'll return to that in a minute. But a lot of this was driven by a concession that Federal Department of Justice counsel made sort of on the fly in oral argument uh, on the appeal. So just think about it for a moment. You've gone into a 12-year litigation process, you've gone to a trial, 
the trial's nine weeks. You lose the trial, and there's all sorts of findings against you. And then you can go on appeal, and it's not in your factum, and it's not part of you, your appeal, but then you're getting questions from the judge, and you make a concession. And then all of a sudden, the court uses that concession to say, in, a, in, in essence, oh, there's not really an issue about non-status Indians. The federal government has just conceded that they do have jurisdiction over them. And because it's a bit hard to understand exactly who non-status Indians are, and we don't see them as a cohesive group, then there's really no need for that declaration. Let me tell you about the concession, because it's the most uh, stunning bit of uh, legal baffle gab I've ever heard in my life. It, it puts the Supreme Court to shame. Um, <laughs> and, and I... I <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and uh, oh yeah, this is being taped, isn't it? Um, anyway, <laughs> the, here is what counsel said, as, as re recorded by the court. Counsel for Canada conceded that the group of people characterized as non-status Indians are those to whom status could be granted by federal legislation, assuming the legislation did not exceed the limits of Section 9124. Now, I don't know if it would have helped if that was written down. I doubt it. But essentially, what they've said, non-status Indians are people that we have jurisdiction to grant status to, assuming that we act within our jurisdiction in granting them status. That is one big, fat tautology. It goes around in a circle. The people we have jurisdiction over are the people that we have jurisdiction over. That's all they said. And for the Federal Court of Appeal to, on the basis of that, ignore all the factual findings about the, the populations and the individuals and the communities in hardship and the jurisdictional avoidance damage that had been done for them over the, uh, to them over the decades uh, was, was frankly uh, very surprising and I think fundamentally unjust. Um, anyway, where does that leave us? Um, there's some commentary from the court about who the Métis are for the purposes of the part of the declaration that survived. Uh, now, the Federal Court of Appeals stopped short of offering a definition of the Métis uh, in, their, in their reasons, and they did that directly at the invitation of the plaintiffs, then respondents, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, Harry Daniels, Leo Gardner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and we'd always said, look, in the Eskimo reference, you don't have a definition of the Inuit or the Eskimo because you don't need it. You can figure that stuff out later. That's a downstream issue. Uh, you solve the point of principle and then hope people will uh, behave the right way, and then you solve the, the downstream issues later. So that was our pitch, uh, and that was partially accepted by the Federal Court of Appeal. But what the Fed, Federal Court of Appeal did say is... Uh, we accept, we're not going to try and define, they know how difficult that is, but they said it, it can't be inconsistent with the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence, such as the Pauli case. Uh, and in particular, that raises an issue w as to whether you need to fit within the three-part test of Pauli and the third of those criteria, which is community acceptance. Um, and uh, the trial judge on that point had said, community acceptance, I understand why it's important for rights-bearing communities. I understand why it's important for Section 35. I'm not sure it fits exactly when we're talking about the exercise of division of powers, which is a much broader concept. Uh, so what happened then? Um, well, of course, uh, the, there's a leaf application uh, uh, that is currently to be decided. Um, I, I have to say that the the plaintiffs, uh, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples and Harry Daniels, uh, played a little bit of a game of chicken with the federal government. We were, we were sure that there was going to be a leave application from them, because why wouldn't they be really unhappy with a decision that's just significantly broadened uh, their responsibilities? The federal government did not seek leave within the initial period uh, that they had, the 60 days that they had. Uh, and uh, we waited until, I think, you know, 4.15 on the last day before putting in our materials because we were sure that theirs were coming, um, speaking of after UL phones. Uh, but if you think about why that would be, it's either because the federal government concluded that the plaintiffs, the, the Congress, was very likely to seek leave anyway on the non-status aspect of it, and they, they called that right, uh, it was either that or because they figured that the result in the Federal Court of Appeal was one that they could live with because it gives them opportunities to do as little as possible and to define the scope of who it covers as uh, as narrowly as possible. Or it might have been both of those things. Uh, in any event, so we applied for leave, and then the federal government applied for 
uh, leave to cross appeal with something called a conditional application for leave to cross appeal, and it's only if we get leave that they would be applying for uh, leave to cross appeal. I've never heard of a conditional application for leave to cross appeal. I looked it up in the Supreme Court of Canada rules. I didn't see anything about it, but in any event, that's what they did. Uh, it, it does seem to be a likely case for uh, granting of leave. I don't, I don't think that Gene went too far out on a limb because the federal government did not oppose the leave application. They said, yeah, we don't oppose, we don't really take a position, but if you grant leave on their part of the case, you should grant leave on the Métis side of the case as well. Uh, and, and frankly, um, uh, for the, the Congress, we, we said, yeah, you know what, that's right, because it's artificial to try and deal with one, one part and not the other, so you should really uh, hear all of it uh, together. So on our side of the uh, leave application, we raised essentially two issues, and I, I just want to talk about them for a minute. The first was that, of course, we want the declaration restored for the non-status Indians, that aspect of uh, CAP's uh, constituency. But the, the second aspect is we said, you know, there is mischief and there are problems with the way in which the Federal Court of Appeal has uh, sort of said the Pauli criteria apply to the exercise of uh, federal jurisdiction. Now, let me say, that is nothing to do with whether the Pauli criteria accurately capture communities. It is nothing to do with whether they, that's the appropriate test for which communities should bear rights under Section 35. Uh, for, for, for those, the, uh, it, it makes eminent sense to, to use the criteria set out in, in Pauli. They're well-grounded in international law, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the problem. You think for a moment, how many communities across Canada have to date been successful in establishing Section 35 rights? I don't know whether it's 10, 15. I'm talking about by litigation. I'm not talking about by negotiation with provinces. I'm talking ones that have won cases where, as a matter of law, you can say these are beneficiaries of Section 35 rights and they have been so found to meet the Pauli criteria. Uh, it's a very small group. And if you think about the federal government's history of evading its responsibilities, you'd hate to have a situation where what the federal government is going to do is, is going to say, oh, you know, oh, here's a, a, another town of uh, 1,400 people, uh, yeah, and, and, uh, or, or, or a community of 1,400 people, and the, the members of that community, they've just been found by the Court of Appeal of whatever province, well, well, they've got Section 35 rights, okay, we've got jurisdiction over them, but not, not the next group over, not, not the community after that, not the people around, not the people south of them, not anybody else. And uh, you, you may perceive this as something that is uh, a, a Congress of Aboriginal people's perspective only. I will say that the uh, Métis General Settlements Council uh, was sufficiently concerned about the same point that when we put in our leave materials and raised this and said, look, it's going to be read way too narrow and it's just not appropriate for the uh, Division of Powers context, they agreed with us. They said, yeah, you know, we've had our problems as well with an unfriendly provincial government and some adverse uh, results in litigation, uh, and we think that that may turn out to be too narrow for the purposes of determining the extent of the federal government power. Um, I do want to give some sense as well of the historical complexity around the issues of how people ended up in the communities that they did. Now, maybe this is all a long time ago and shouldn't really count, but, but there are some things that, that uh, struck me from the case that makes me think that the issues of dividing lines between who is or is not a First Nation or Métis or non-status Indians may not be quite as clean historically as, as some people think. So, <laughs> for example, and, and this is all from the record, there's one woman who I think we had uh, moving back and forth between um, different statuses uh, five or six times in the course of a, a few years. And, and why was it? Because, you know, she, she was mixed Aboriginal ancestry. She was in uh, probably Alberta or, or Saskatchewan before they became provinces in the 19th century. Uh, she would have taken scrip, uh, but then she married uh, someone who was in treaty, so by that marriage she becomes, you know, a treaty Indian. Uh, I think she got widowed at one point, and then she married a non 
First Nation or non-treaty Indian, so she, she loses that. And uh, she may have even showed up twice to get script because the records were not that great back then. And, but none of that had anything to do with her identity. That wasn't who she was. That was just she drifted between government categories. That's what I say. This was all about the history of government policy. You could probably have sat down with her and talked to her and got a good sense of what she self-identified as, but that's not what really the case was about. Uh, my, another favorite that I had uh, was, was looking at the kind of documentation that was available to people to make their, their choices. You know, we know it was a, it was a bit of a mess, uh, particularly in, in the years around 1885 uh, out in the West, uh, after the collapse of the, the buffalo hunt and the, uh, the collapse of the, uh, um, the harvesting economy and the hunting economy and, and uh, and you've got, you know, well, you can get some money sort of on a short-term basis by getting script, and then you know, there's the script spec speculators that are about five minutes behind the script commissions, uh, and then you've also got treaty, which is a lot less money, but then it's an income stream, but you've got people who are not terribly, you know, astute in terms of understanding the long-term consequences of this, and people react to short-term incentives. That's often the way it's been. It's probably still true to some extent to, uh, today, but, but people just sort of make very atomistic on the ground decisions and then that, it turned out, uh, had the capacity to affect not just them but their ancestors and their status uh, forever after. So we looked at one particular little form in, in which it was, I'm going to make up the name and I'm going to make up the language but you'll get the idea. It's a, you know, I, Jean Belgard, uh, hereby solemnly affirm that being in full possession of my faculties and in full understanding of the nature and consequences of my actions, I hereby do renounce uh, my right and the right of my descendants to any and all benefits uh, flowing from treaty by accepting the script. It's, it was something like that. It was very complicated. And then there's the signature line and you see an X. And that was very, very common. The majority of those signatures, these were not people who were reading and writing, right? So you have to wonder about the origins uh, uh, of some of these divisions uh, when you go back uh, that, that far. And I'm not talking about going back to the 18th century. I'm talking about the rollout of the treaty and the script system uh, in sort of late 19th century. Uh, another uh, sort of set of, of, of facts in the Treaty 8 area, it, it turned out that uh, you know, people would take script. Um, but then, as we know, by the 1890s, there were a lot of destitute uh, uh, Métis, uh, and, and they'd sort of find their way, or their children or grandchildren would find their way back into, or not back, they would find their way to Indian reserves because there were kinship ties, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that became perceived as a problem in the 1940s, uh, and there was a, a commission in Alberta that looked at it, the McDonald Commission, to try and figure out what to do with uh, these people, and they essentially recommended, well, give them Indian status and it doesn't matter that they or their ancestors took scrip. Uh, and uh, that was initially rejected by the government, but then there was legislation passed early in the Diefen Diefenbaker years that, uh, that allowed, uh, notwithstanding the taking of scrip, that uh, allowed the granting of Indian status to those people. Uh, so, you know, history is a little... Uh, messier. Uh, residential schools. You know, I, I don't know if this part is a phenomenon in Canada the way it is in Australia, where I spent a lot of time and I, my family is originally from. Uh, but uh, there was actually mixed ancestry aboriginals were more vulnerable to residential schools in Australia rather than less vulnerable. That was just sort of the way it was. They were kind of targeted. Uh, so people were taken to residential schools on, on an individual level, right? And that would often result, maybe not for, for, for all cases, but it would result in some cases in people losing their links to the community. Well, are you going to say about those people? Well, there's, yeah, there's no community acceptance uh, there anymore, so regardless of what kind of ancestry they are, they're not within the federal power, there is no federal responsibility to them. That doesn't seem right to... Uh, doesn't seem right to me. Uh, interestingly, when you look at the Indian, or uh, sorry, not the Indian, the Inuit land claim agreements, there was never an Inuit act. So following the uh, re-Eskimos, what happened is essentially there's a series of negotiations and eventually the, the federal government enters into framework agreements with the various Inuit communities. There's at least one of those, and I don't know which one it is, but uh, there's at least one, uh, where it says you can establish your status as a beneficiary of this framework agreement and thereby come into federal jurisdiction by demonstrating your link to a historic Inuit community, fine, or your link to the land. And either was possible. And that kind of makes sense in the context of the North. You might have had very small groups. And where does community end and family group or even smaller groups 
uh, uh, begin in that context. So, uh, you know, there's more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in, in your uh, philosophy, Horatio, as they, as they say in, uh, uh, in Hamlet. Um, I, I do very much uh, look forward uh, to seeing this uh, go to the Supreme Court if uh, leave is granted, and I think we may get into some of these questions uh, from a variety of perspectives, and that can only be uh, uh, good on the issue. Uh, and I, I want to end with one thing. I, I have always believed that the prime problem is not the perceptions, the divisions, the uh, debates that may exist and occur in the Aboriginal communities. That's not really the issue of the case. It's the capacity for federal government mischief that is the real danger here. And I'm going to leave you with one final example. Uh, we, we came across some correspondence, again, produced by way of discovery, uh, about the situation north of 60 in northern Canada uh, in the mid-90s. And uh, anyone remember the federal interlocutor? I don't know if they're still called that, but you know, in, in the 1980s, they came up with this idea that you're not going to have a federal cabinet minister. That's not going to be a minister of Métis and uh, non-status Indian affairs. They're going to be called an interlocutor because nobody knows what that means and that doesn't pin us down, right? So um, in the 90s, you, you got the, uh, it's probably starting from about the 70s, you got a real process going up north and it was understood by everybody that there were First Nation groups and there were Métis groups and they had different uh, complexities, identities, they had different interests, different needs. So of course you'd want to negotiate with them separately, which, which happened. In one example, the uh, on the ground, uh, Diane, uh, Indian and Northern Affairs, were quite close to reaching an agreement with a particular BT group. The Federal Interlocutor's Office got wind of it, and they hit the roof. They said, oh, no, you can't do that, because that's going to raise expectations south of 60. If we have treaties with Métis as separate groups, uh, you know, everything is going to, all hell's going to break loose. But, but wait a minute, aren't these, isn't the Federal Interlocutor the one that's supposed to have a protective role to be advancing the cause of Métis uh, in Canada, including in the North? It, it's, they just sort of totally lost the plot. And I, I think the problem with this case is if it is not not, uh, if we don't get the right declaration from the Supreme Court, assuming that it goes there, uh, we're just going to be back into the same thing that we've had for the last hundred years in some other form. Thank you. Well, that was a lot to cover. We've got time for a number of questions, a couple of questions before our reception. I would encourage people, if you have a question, nice succinct question to get up to the mic and either clarify or challenge our panel. Sir. Gérard Lévesque. Uh, I wonder if the precedent of Father Albert Lacombe have been used in negotiation or in pleas. Um, especially for St. Paul, because he has been successfully negotiating with the federal government for lands rights and money, and it resulted in the settlement of St. Paul. And next February, there's a case or information that will be, that is scheduled for Supreme Court of Canada that comes down from Louise Riel's heritage. It's a, a language case from Alberta, whether Alberta was uh, had jurisdiction in 1988 to abolish the right to French language laws. Um, for information, I, I am often in front of the courts in Alberta in the last eight years, and when I plead in French, even in federal rights, uh, like criminal cases, well, uh, I had the case where the judge made uh, an oral decision, and I had to order the transcript so my client would realize why she won. And Nothing that the judge said in French is in the transcript. Nothing that I plead in French is in the transcript because according to the present directions of Alberta for judicial transcript, if it's not in English, you explain why it's not in a transcript. It is, an, in bracket, foreign language spoken. I'm, I'm happy to comment briefly on the first point, this, the St. Paul de Métis example. That is actually one that we raised uh, and had evidence, uh, expert evidence on before the trial judge because it showed a convergence of policy. And so that the idea that there's always been a bright line in government policy between uh, Indian and Métis is, is mistaken because y y you often have government policies uh, addressing in similar ways. We know that 
largely in treaty there was a division, but even then there was the Treaty 3 adhesion in, in 1873 that was commented on by the trial judge. But at St. Paul de Métis, you had uh, Father Lacombe persuaded the federal government to assemble some land, and the land was to be held communally, and they had not a residential school, but an industrial school, uh, and it looked an awful lot like a reserve or Indian type structure, but they just wouldn't call it that. Now, part of the reason why they wouldn't call it that, and this is in the documents uh, at the time, is that it was seen, this is in the 1890s, this will, this will offend the sensibilities of the Métis if they're equated with Indians, so they don't want to be given the same labels. But nevertheless, the response of the government is the same. And that's one of my basic points. Another question? Yes. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, I had a question. How do you think uh, Chacolton will impact future legal cases? And do you think it'll set a precedence for those cases? That sounds like next year's program. <laughs> <Yeah>. OK. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, maybe I'll put on my hat be, as um, I am actually a treaty negotiator for um, the Stalo Treaty in British Columbia. Um, so the Chilcotin case is very much uh, on the agenda in those um, situations. But I just have to say that um, Jason and I are in the same law firm, and there's seven of us partners, and we spent two days in October, seven people sitting around a table for two full days trying to crack what Chilcotin means in all the different, for all the different clients we represent. So I represent on the West Coast in the BC treaty process, um, the Stalo, who are negotiating a treaty. So that's the modern land claims uh, BC process. They have unextinguished Aboriginal title. We represent Métis, obviously, who have, I would say, unextinguished <laughs> Aboriginal title, certainly claims um, out there. Um, we represent First Nations who are part of the historic treaties who supposedly have extinguished um, title. And uh, we represent people in the North who are in the modern land claims processes with treaties where their title has not been extinguished because they're non-extinguishment treaties. So in all of those situations, Chilcotin has a different... Uh, it rings differently, right? So. One of the things that we were talking about was for the people who are in, for example, treaties that are the full extinguishment ones, so for those of you who know the numbered treaties, Robinson-Huron treaties, we, one of the things we thought is that um, Chilcotin does actually give us some very good information because it tells you, it, it basically tells you what they gave up. So we never knew that before, right, because people didn't know what title was, and the Crown's theory certainly was that title was little pinpoints, right? It was a fishing rock or a small little village. But now that it is a territorial concept with decision-making attached to it, governance powers attached to it, and the lands and resources vest in the people. So for all the lawyers in the room, we all know that's a that's serious statement here that um, is, is very, very much a changed world here. So the minute you've got those kinds of things, now we know what, for example, the Treaty 9 people gave up, right? And maybe we got a cost that we can assign to that now when you start to think about it. So when they go into negotiations, we can, we can stand there and say, hey, wait a minute here. You're negotiating with us to, do, to take up lands in our territories. We got some sense of what, of a, a stronger hand for consultation, uh, and Mikasu puts us in that world. So for those people, I think that says something. I think for Métis are more, to my mind, in the situation we're in, in with Stalo, because your title is not resolved, so therefore, theoretically, it's still in existence. And so what does that mean? What does that give you in your hand to negotiate with? And think about what title is said to be. In Chilcotin, they say title is is inalienable, right? So that means you can't, except to the crown, right? But um, how does that affect us in the BC treaty process? Whoa, they're giving us our land in fee simple and telling us you can go sell it. But if that's your title land, maybe we've got a real problem here, right? Like maybe that's totally incompatible with the way the law is now. Might have been fine before June 26th, but as of June 26th, maybe the BC treaty process is out of whack with the law. Um, it also creates an extraordinary idea um, that 
I mean, it's a good idea, actually, I think. The idea that your land, your title land, has to be sustainably developed, right? So sustainable development, well, isn't that sweet that that's something that's put on Aboriginal title land but not on Crown land? <laughs> Crown doesn't have any obligation to sustainably develop its lands. It can screw it up royally, right? Um, and, and does, right, <laughs> all over the place. It's just a royal prerogative. Yes, <laughs> right. But we have to look after it for the benefit of future generations. So that is a big, big, big idea. The other big idea that is going to play out in the future is um, going back to the Indian Act, right? So the idea is that on Aboriginal title land, you have uh, proactive use and management of, that, of those resources that you own, right? So let's play that out a little bit. So with the Chilcotin, that was a large chunk of territory with six separate First Nations, right? Okay, but those First Nations, they only have jurisdiction on their reserves. They have absolutely no jurisdiction off their reserves because they're caught in the band structure and the Indian Act structure. So, but the Supreme Court says they have proactive use and management of that huge territory which goes way beyond their um, band councils, right? So they're stuck in an Indian Act band council scheme, administrative scheme, but they now have to make decisions with respect to a large territory and they have no structure for it, they've not got governance powers for it, there's no no, um, there's no entity to deal with it. Now, the other thing you have to put that together with is that the federal government has been going across this country and slashing tribal council funding, left, right, and center. The tribal councils are basically dead entities for the last three or four years because they have not got a penny to play with. So, but it's clearly it's the tribal council that is the logical entity to proactively use and manage those lands. But we don't have them. I mean, they're there, but we all know that if you don't have any money, you don't have any ability to even get people together because they've got to travel to get there, they've got to do something, they've got to have something to work with, and they have nothing. So how's this going to play out in the future? Well, I think it's going to play out everywhere, but I don't think it's going to play out quickly. Um, I think we saw in, let me tell you what happened with the last few times we've seen big major changes. And I have to tell you, this one's bigger. Like this is bigger than Sparrow. <laughs> this is bigger than Calder was, right? Because we actually have one here. And the other thing is it's really serious, really, really serious. It's one thing for the government to say, okay, you can go hunting out there. Go get yourself a moose, boy, that's fine. You know, that really, what does that do to Enbridge? <laughs> you know, what do they care? You know, it doesn't make any difference to them. But you tell them that perhaps, uh, let's just say there's, say there's what, I don't know how many First Nations in British Columbia, but say there's 80 First Nations, and each one of them can claim about 15% of their territory. I would say that as of June 26, the BC government owns a lot less land and has a lot less power over a lot less land and decision-making power than it thought it did, right? And that changed overnight, right? So now, and then think about what else Chilcotin says. So it says that if they've done something wrong, then you've got claims and damages, right? So look what happened in Chilcotin. They're, they get, I can't remember the name of the forestry company because they keep changing. It's Weyerhaeuser changes into something else, into something else. But anyway, it's a forestry company, right? So as a result of Chilcotin, they lost their forestry license, right? It's gone. You don't have that anymore. Now, they were promised that by the British Columbia government, right? Looks to me like they could sue BC, saying, you know, you, you promised us this thing, it's worth millions of dollars, okay? So BC is vulnerable to a suit from a mining company or a logging company or anybody who loses it like this. And then, if they're also vulnerable because the, the court was pretty clear. Chilcotin can turn around, I thought, reading that, and say, sue the government for the stuff that was taken out unlawfully, right? The government is just like caught in a huge bind. And if you were a developer in British Columbia or you were advising a developer in British Columbia, wouldn't you be thinking twice about saying, oh yeah, go ahead, open up a mine over here? 
oh yeah, go ahead, let's issue a, just go apply for a forestry lease. If you thought that that group, if they then 10 years down the road took on a court case and then could turn around and, and sue you for it, that you, I think it's huge, huge, huge change, and there's a lot of discussions all over the map, um, all across British Columbia. And so British Columbia, I think, um, has to be very, very careful about what they do, because if they try to ignore this, they will simply drive every single First Nation to court. And if you don't think the First Nations have the bit between their teeth after Chilcotin, they do. Right? And those of us who've been sitting in the treaty table for 17 years with no results because the government's offering little tiny things that are unacceptable, it won't take much for them to sit up and say, what are we doing here? We could go to court. And the government says, oh, that's, you know, it'll take you 20 years. Well, they've been at the table for 20 years. So what's the difference? Why not go and get a judgment that you'll... See, and the Chilcotin are in some ways the hard case and then in some ways they're the easy case. So they're the easy case because there wasn't a lot of overlap stuff going on, right? So their exclusivity claim was easy to prove. But they're the hard case. They're semi-nomadic. They moved around over it. They were very small numbers over a large territory. Now, I represent the Stalo. These people had 10 village sites within a five-mile area. There were 10,000 of them at the assertion of sovereignty. You think they can't prove title? You think the Haida, who were all isolated on their island, can't prove title? I mean, I think if the Chilcotin can prove title, everybody can, right? And that is the assumption the BC government should be working on. And if I were them, now, of course, they don't listen to me, but... If I were them, wow, I would be getting ready to do major discussions and agreements in an attempt to keep my province from crumbling under the weight of nobody wanting to do business with you anymore. So if you think how it's gonna play out in the cases, I think we're gonna see lots of cases about this as the First Nations fight the government to get them to honor what Chilcotin means in spirit and in law. That was a very long answer, sorry. So one of the punishments I have as being a moderator sorry. is that uh, at least the clock at the back says it's getting to six o'clock. And uh, I'm under orders to make sure that everybody has a chance to uh, continue this dialogue upstairs. I know, Jason, you were just about to get in. I saw Carrie. Uh, we could probably go, as uh, Jean, you were saying, for another hour and a half. But I think I do have to bring us to a close and thank everyone for coming. And there is an evaluation form, and Jean may have prefigured some of the topics that you would be interested in hearing more about <coughs> at another session. But at this point, I would like to thank um, Andrew Loken, Jean Taye, and Jason Madden very warmly. Thank you, everybody.